We call ourselves the American Digestif. It unleashed sort of this creative floodgates, and so that became our route into the market. My name is Louise Newsom, and you're listening to The Makers, brought to you by Trade and Prosper. On this episode, you will meet Josh Morton, founder and owner of Barrows and Tens Ginger Liqueur, based out of Industry City, Brooklyn. It was definitely good, old fashion Brooklyn, New York, kind of industrial sort of thing. It was myself, Blue Marble Ice Cream, and Colson's Bakery. For Josh, a lesson in the making of Lemoncello, a century-old lemon-flavored liqueur popular throughout Italy, began with old-school technique, but soon evolved into something a bit more groundbreaking. And after making batches of it for friends who loved it, and nearly two years of focused recipe development, launched his creation commercially. Hey, Josh. Great, you got me yawning. Uh, it's okay. You've had most probably a hectic weekend <laughs> in this industry, right? Uh, life. <laughs> life. That's right. Married, child, business. Everything. Everything. Well, I came here this morning, got here a couple of minutes before you, and uh, Noah was kind enough to give me a morning shot. Should have had one of those. That would have been good. Of your amazing product, um, Barrows and Tents. So tell me the story behind Barrows and Tents. So Barrows and Tents Ginger Liqueur is something I made for my friends for about 10 years before turning it into a product. I started out playing around making limoncellos and then riffing on that and came up with adding ginger to my limoncello. And then because I was lazy, uh, I just did the ginger and didn't do the lemon because the lemon was a lot more work. And my friends really liked that version better. And so I just kept making it. So why the ginger? Because the lemon wasn't punchy enough or different enough? Um, no, I mean, I was perfectly happy with the limoncello, but I was experimenting. And so I was trying different things. So I did rosemary, I did horseradish, I did grapefruit, I did blood orange, and we had some ginger in the house. And so I tried that. When did you start doing this at home? So it would have been around 2000, maybe a little after that, that I started. Was this your first spot here in Industry City? So this is our, technically our fourth spot in Industry City, but really our third, because we never moved into our second. We moved in a, almost a year ago now. We weren't fully up and running. We opened the tasting room um, to test it starting in December. So it's been four months, I guess, since the tasting room's been open, but we were doing production before that, and slowly getting kinks out. Originally, we moved into Industry City when it was Bush Terminals, before Jamestown bought in the new developers, the same developers who did Chelsea Market, and it was just where, raw warehouse space. Uh, Industry City, if you don't know about it, is 6.6 .6 million square feet. It's like a 20 billion, and I think it's 20 billion building complex. And five years ago, got taken over by Jamestown, who developed Chelsea Market, and they are upgrading the campus and doing similar to Chelsea Market, but on a larger scale. And because of the scope, keeping the manufacturing here, as opposed to just turning it into a mall like Chelsea Market's become. So Industry City, I mean, just to explain where it is. It is, I mean, it's across the river from Manhattan. I mean, you come in from, you came here from Manhattan this yeah. morning. How long does it take you? Um, it's not that bad. I mean, on the subway, it's literally the second stop in Brooklyn on the D, if you're taking the Express. It's in Sunset Park right on the water. Um, it's between 2nd and 3rd Ave, and in the 30s of Sunset Park. So you chose this spot for production. That's what you were thinking initially, right? Yeah. And when was that? That was 2013. And in those days, this space was just full of, full of what? Who was here? It was warehouse space mainly. We were we, in building two, which is now the food hall, uh, which is all full. It was myself, Blue Marble Ice Cream, and Colson's Bakery. And it was literally just their production facilities. They, they had no public facing access at all when I moved in. And then the entire rest of the floor was empty space. It was literally, there was nothing there, no walls, no, no nothing. Doors barely closed, stray cats, snow blowing in underneath. There was a, a abandoned pickup truck in the courtyard there um, that someone had worked on and then just I guess just abandoned. left, whatever. Um, <laughs> worked so on was, and it didn't work. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was definitely good old, 
fashion, Brooklyn, New York kind of industrial sort of thing. And, and now it's the Nets training center is here. They have uh, MakerBot came in. There's lots of office sort of stuff on the upper floors. And then on the first floors, what they're doing is doing um, all sorts of different retail and or manufacturing. Um, and so we're here. Brooklyn Cora, which is a sake producer, is here. Big Alice Brewery is here. Um, I see distilling is moving back. They sort of moved around within the space. Fort Hamilton Whiskey just signed. A standard Wormwood is coming in. There's going to be a sparkling winemaker. There's another brewery coming in. And then they're talking to some other distilleries as well. So it's in our area, it's going to be Distillery Row. Right. There's a whole series of sort of furniture design tile kind of places that are coming in. So it's going to be that sort of stuff. There's a restaurant supply guy. There is Japan Village, which is sort of an Italy uh, type experience, but for Japanese food. And then they're going to be adding a second floor to that with sort of Japanese books and other sort of soft goods. And so they're slowly developing each building to have a different sort of theme. Hometown Barbecue is going to open up across from us. So it's, it's so a lot of stuff. So when you moved here, did you ever think that this is what it was going to become? No, I moved here for cheap rent and the ability to distill, you needed to have uh, certain zoning and you needed to have a landlord that would approve you distilling in their space. Right. Unless you bought a building, which I couldn't afford to do. Um, so in New York City. Um, and so that's why I found the space. It was, it was literally just from a production standpoint, it was inexpensive and it checked all the boxes. And then when Jamestown got in, we're still not interested in, in having a retail component because our model in the beginning, and still is, was to be a national brand. And uh, as a liqueur, since we do one product, I mean, a lot of small craft distillers have a whole portfolio of products that they're doing. And they're also doing base spirits, which is a very different model. Um, in our case, we're doing a liqueur. So we are a modifier in most situations and we're also sort of a little more obscure in the liquor stores so people aren't necessarily coming into the local liquor store looking for a ginger liqueur they're looking for a vodka or a whiskey or a gin and a wine and then they all discover us and hopefully bring us home as well but that's not usually what brought them to the liquor store to begin with um, and then in terms of on-premise bars restaurants that sort of stuff it, when we are in cocktails instead of being an ounce and a half or two ounce pour we're a half ounce we're a quarter ounce we're sort of maybe a three quarter you know um a, a you get it. If we're an ounce, that's exciting, right? So the amount of volume that we do per account is much lower. So we, our strategy was to go wide as opposed to going deep. Um, and so we're in 45 states, but we have a very light footprint sort of everywhere. And we're slowly building, on, building that. on that. It takes a lot to sort of get brand awareness. And once when people know about us, they love it. So, tell, so brand awareness, tell... Tell me some steps that you went, that you put in place to create that brand awareness or to build on it and what you're doing, what you're thinking in the future going forward. So our brand right now, we're probably 80% on versus off-premise. On-premise being bars, restaurants, off-premise being liquor stores. And most established brands are probably 60-40, where 60% off-premise. 40% uh, on premise. But for us building the brand, we, we focused on bars and restaurants and that approach. And we've done a lot with the USPG. We've done a lot with the bartender community to get them educated on our product. The interesting thing is I never made a cocktail with it in the 10 years I was making it for my friends. I only served it on the rocks as a digestif. It was never intended to be anything but a digestive. And I didn't come from the bar community. I didn't come from, I wasn't a bartender. I wasn't a, I wasn't a mixologist. I didn't know anything about that sort of stuff. So what ended up happening is when I started selling it, as soon as bartenders saw it, got their hands on it, they got excited and it, it unleashed sort of this creative floodgates and there was all sorts of things that they started doing with it 
that was delicious. And so that became our route into the market. We, we call ourselves the American digestif. The digestif is something that's European. It's very common uh, in especially Italy, thus limoncello. Um, you have Sambuca, you have other things where people after dinner will look at a little um, something to sip on. We took that idea and then we blended it with you know, Asian spices, i.e. the ginger, and came up with something that didn't exist before, which is a very American thing to do. And so we call ourselves the American Digestif because of that sort of stealing from all around the world to come up with something that didn't exist. And ginger's a natural digestif, it's an antioxidant, it's an energy booster, and it's an aphrodisiac. So if you're at the end of your meal, those are all four things you're really gonna want. So it works great for that. So as you were building this out, I mean, on a business level, did you self-fund this or did you have to bring in investors? So I self-funded it for the first three, four years, I can't remember. And then we did a, um, a WeFunder, an equity crowdfunding campaign. How did that go? It went really well. We, we have 550 equity crowdfunding investors. The average investor was around $500. Um, so we raised about $350,000 on that. And then we did a, a little bit of friends and family investment, not too much, and then some, some personal loans and that sort of stuff. Interesting how that's, whoopsie. Uh-oh, <laughs> did that work? Okay, dog attack. Dog attack. <laughs> it's definitely a crapshoot. The key, I think, for me was two things. Number one, timing and uh, also the platform I chose. For those not familiar with equity crowdfunding, you have what would be, um, everyone knows sort of like crowdfunding in terms of, you know, the Indiegogo or... Uh, GoFundMe. GoFundMe um, and those sorts of things where people, basically they're pre-selling a product and you put some money towards the product and then when it gets funded, you get the product hopefully six months later or whatever it is. And about two and a half years ago, they changed the law to allow for small companies to actually raise money. Uh, so basically, it's, it's, it's a mini IPO or, or you know, similar, but without being on a stock market. And you can actually, instead of giving someone uh, a doodad, you're giving them equity in your company or you're giving them uh, a revenue share or some other thing. And so we came out, we were supposed to launch the, with the initial week that it became legal and we had ran into some issues because we were a guinea pig, if you will. We were in that first group and there was some issues with around our corporate structure and we needed to deal with some accounting stuff. So we didn't launch with that initial group, we launched a month later which was good and bad because we missed that in sort of initial wave. And then we got lucky and we got written up in a, um, an equity crowdfunding newsletter and that sort of spiked our traffic. And then the next thing, once we were sort of in the top group <clears throat> of offerings, then it just sort of self-fed at that point. So most of the money that was raised was raised from people we had never met before or knew, which was pretty amazing. And you think that um, article was pivotal though? Oh, it was huge. We, I mean, literally, uh, we were getting an investment a day and then we were getting, you know, an investment every 10 minutes after that. And it was, you, you know, you hear the stories of the hockey stick on the internet where it's, you know, you're going along, going along, and all of a sudden it just takes off. And it was literally, we raised, um, we'd done like $30,000 in the first month and a half, and then in two days we raised another $100,000. Wow. So it just, and then, and then from there we were, we were off to the races. We chose WeFunder, which is a, a, one of the platforms, and it's the number one platform. It, at the time it was, it was sort of the newer, they were all, everyone was new, so we didn't really know who was who yet. Um, but in working with them, they just seemed to be the, have their crap together the most. And As a so, business, though, did you have to fit into a category to be able to use that platform? No, no. no? They, the law is written so that anyone can use any platform, technically. The way the platforms get around it is they kind of ghost the companies they're not interested in working with, I think. But technically, they're, <laughs> they're supposed to put anyone up who qualifies in terms of the accounting and the other legal requirements. They're not supposed to pick winners and losers. but. They all do curate to an extent, uh, I think, if, if not explicitly unintentionally. It was a great experience. And, and the one thing that I'm a little disappointed about is 
We got a little bit of engagement from our investor community. I was hoping we were gonna get a lot more engagement. And I think now that we have the tasting room, we're gonna reach out to them again and sort of try and engage them. But we have investors from all over the world, so obviously the tasting room isn't applicable to everyone. Collaboration is the key to what we're doing because as a modifier, we work with everybody. If you go to our website, you'll see the recipes. It's divided by spirit category. And we have everything from you know, the obvious whiskey and gin, but we have beer and we have tequila and we have mezcal and we have brandies and you name it, it's on there and food as well. So our stuff mixes with everybody. We play with everybody, which then became the theme behind our tasting room in that if you're gonna make a cocktail with a, with a gin, well, I'm friends with lots of distillers, so whose gin was I gonna pick? And also, there's so many good gins out there from, in, from New York State. It became a situation where, well, if we're gonna have four or five gins, well, what if I had all the gins? And then, what if I had all the whiskey? So we now have over 160 different bottles at our tasting room from th over 35 different New York State distillers. And the only reason that number stopped there is because I ran out of shelf space. So we're the largest selection of New York State spirits anywhere in the world, as far as I know, that you can have by the glass or by the bottle. It's right. all New York State agriculturally produced New York State spirits. Which means 75%. Yes, of the grown content in is grown in New York State, yep. The Makers is brought to you by Trade and Prosper. Here we share the stories of individuals and businesses that make our communities. We believe in those who are committed to doing well by doing good, using their hands, minds and hearts to create a better place for us all and believe that a little sweat and a lot of sharing turns a community into a populace of prosperity. Trade and Prosper is a forum where those like-minded individuals meet to trade ideas, information, goods and services, as well as build long-lasting relationships that enable them to expand their reach locally and also globally. For more information on our organization and for more podcast episodes, head over to tradeandprosper.com. Follow us on social media for the latest news and events about businesses near you. Yeah, I mean, the tasting room is, a, is, is the latest example of sort of our ethos. I mean, I've always been someone who works well with all sorts of different personalities. As long as I know what that personality is, I can deal with it. So I, in my previous life, I was a consultant. And as a consultant, you're working with all sorts of different people, all sorts of different business owners, all sorts of other consultants. And you, to be successful, you need to be able to adapt to work with different personalities. And you're going to have some people who are, you know, very scattered and all over the place and not organized. And you need to be able to deal with that and compensate for their shortfalls in that aspect. Um, but they may have, you know, other things in terms of their creativity or their passion or things that, that make up for it. Um, and then you, there's other people where they're very anal and they're super buttoned up and you need to be able to shift gears and work with that. And in those cases, they may not be as creative. They may not be as flexible. They may not be able to sort of see the bigger picture. So you need to be able to sort of help them sort of in the areas where they're lacking. And so for me, I, was, I did that for 25 years before I got into this business. Everything I did always was around collaboration, around working with others, and it was sort of a win-win. I did better by um, collaborating than by competing. And I was competitive, but it wasn't, the, the wasn't, it was more about the collaboration. And so it was instinctual that I, and that I would do that. And then the nature of the product also fit that model. Uh, there's no other ginger liqueur made in New York state. So I have no natural competitor in New York state. The only other real competitor I have is, an, is a big national brand that's 
owned by Heaven Hill and they're a big corporate sort of thing. And so it's all, they're a whole different, different model. whole different model, whole different animal. Yeah. Um, and then early on, we got approached by Soralis USA, which is the parent company of Don Q Rum, um, about taking us on as a brand for, as an agency brand for their portfolio. They were also uh, at the time working with Death Store Spirits. And so we joined up with them, and so we collaborated. And obviously, you know, the Dark and Stormy is a really popular rum cocktail. Um, we also do, you know, all sorts of uh, other cocktails with them. And we were doing cocktails with Death Store in terms of their gin and, and other stuff. And so we went from being a small little New York State company to being in basically a national company. So we're in 45 states. There's a few states down south and some control states and things like South Dakota or whatever that we're not in. But, um, or North Dakota, I can't remember. One of the Dakotas we're not in, we're in the other one. Um, and we're, we're on the menu at Benihana's. We are um, True Foods Kitchens in Zinberger. You know, we have some, some national account and regional accounts that we've gotten into, which is great. And we're really working on doing more of that. But collaborating with them and working with them as a partner was huge for us. That, mm. that enabled us to sort of punch above our weight, um, trying to be in 45 states as a small little producer on our own would have been impossible. And that's, I think, the reason that we got our partnership with Soralis is that when we were coming up, um, we were only in 70 accounts, I think, at, this, at the point where Soralis reached out to us. And just in New York City, we were super tiny. We were self-distributing. We also entered in a contest. I think that's how we were originally sort of, and we got best in class platinum the same year that their Grand Añejo did. Um, so I think they originally sort of saw, found us there and then went online and saw our social media presence and saw the fact that, you know, w there were some big name New York bartenders who were, you know, using our stuff. And so that made us look like we were bigger than we were. Whereas if we had been in Cleveland and, you know, a couple of Cleveland bartenders were using our stuff, it wouldn't have had the same impact because the folks um, at Soralis probably wouldn't have known those bartenders, or maybe they would have known one of them, but it's very different, you know. Some of those challenges, I mean, in learning curves, even more than challenges, I mean, it's setting up any business, right? I mean, you weren't, like you said, you weren't in this business beforehand, you were consulting. What are some of those hurdles and... Well, that's the thing that, that I found surprising was the fact that I didn't know anything about the spirits business and in the beginning, I thought that that was a real issue. And, and it was, I mean, it, I, I definitely, if I had had a bunch of, if I was starting now, I would have a lot more uh, advantages than when I did start, um, obviously. But the part that I didn't realize was as important as it was, was the fact that for 25 years, I had been running my own business and I had been consulting with small businesses and helping them build their businesses. And that aspect of running a business was not foreign to me. It was old hat. And so I remember early on being around some other small distilleries that, were, that had started up, but they were maybe a year or two ahead of me, or they had come from the liquor business. And they were struggling with the hours. They were struggling with the fact that everything's on you. They were struggling with the fact that it's two in the morning and you've been working all day and you're, you know, have to load out and then you're on to something the next day and there is no one else to do it but you. And I didn't even notice that aspect. It just was in the nature, you know, okay, I, I worked all day at my day job. I went home, I had dinner with my family. I came here, well, over to building two and went to my little space and started doing production till three in the morning and then went home and did it all over again. And then the next day I was grabbing product and running around and selling and doing this. And then, oh, I have to figure out, you know, what the filing is for this, you know, state, Ta you know, label approval and, oh, well, what am I going to do about the labeling and the packaging and, oh, we need to do a promo and I got to get this set up on social media and just every little thing that you're doing, it's all on you. That can be overwhelming to someone who's never done that before. And the fact that I had been doing it, I didn't even notice that that was unusual. Everyone's like, hey, you're doing all these things. I'm like, yeah, who else would? Like, that's what you do. It was all learning about 
how does the liquor business work, where's my product fit, all those sorts of things. And, and then once I partnered up with Soralis, the beauty of that was all of a sudden I gained between their senior staff, a hundred years worth of industry experience. And I had people at my fingertips where if I had a question, I had an answer. And in the beginning, that was one of the things that was most frustrating is when I had a question, I didn't have an answer because I didn't know where to go for it. There was no easy person. Who do I ask? Who do I, you know? So if you're getting into any business, getting yourself a good advisory board that has industry experience is super important. And I think that that was one of the things that I didn't do early on that I wish I had. And there's some aspects that starting over, I would have done differently if I had had people early on saying, hey, did you think about that? So tell us about Tasting Room Takeovers. What's that all about? So we're, it's an exciting um, collaboration that we're doing for us because we have so many other distillers who we have at the tasting room. And we, as a farm distiller, need to produce 50 gallons a year of New York State ag spirits. Um, Bears and Tents is not something that I would distill here. We actually purchase our neutral grain, 75% of it, uh, from New York State, from other distillers. And for the stuff that we're going to make here, the name of my distillery is Proof of Concept. And my thinking was, instead of us trying to develop a brand of our own, wouldn't it be fun to have distillers from around New York State be able to come down to our tasting room, take it over for the day, and do a collaboration with us. And the idea is that we'll produce a small batch of whatever the collaboration is, and then half the product will get sold at our tasting room and half the product will get sold at their tasting room. It'll be a really limited run, you know, maybe 100 bottles total, if that, will get, an, at, at get produced. And so it'll be this kind of uh, fun, exciting thing. And also we have some distillers who've said, oh, I really wanted to try this thing, but from a production standpoint, it's a pain in the butt to do an experimental run on their still. And so it gives them an opportunity to, to experiment on our still and see if it's something that they want to then turn into a, a product going forward for them in their tasting room. Brilliant idea. It's going to be fun. I think it's, I think I, I'm just, I'm super excited about it. Just from this year, playfulness of it and how much fun we're going to have. And, and, and I'm a big fan of, of uh, my fellow New York distillers. They make great stuff. They're great people. And so if we can provide them an opportunity to do something uh, for their company, it helps them, helps us, you know, uh, rising tide lifts all boats or something. Is that what they say? Thank you for joining me this week on The Makers, brought to you by Trade and Prosper. Follow us on your preferred listening channel for new episodes released every Monday. Tune in next week for a conversation with Tomasz Monoshi of Tomasz Tapas Bar and Restaurant and his personal journey immigrating to the U.S. and following his dream to open his own restaurant.